Yeah, so so thank you, Aspen. This, this is a cool infographic. Unfortunately, it's wrong. There, there's some errors in it, but I do like it. it it's, a, it's a nice picture in the background. Um, it, it gets some of the volumes wrong because um, it was done by an artist and not a scientist, but that's okay. Um, uh, but this actually is inspiring. A, a, this has inspired a paper a colleague and I are uh, working on where we're trying to pull together all the oil spill data um, across the planet, but that, that's a little bit of an endeavor. <coughs> I want to talk today about, uh, or start talking about oil spills. <coughs> Excuse me. Over the course of the semester, we'll hear some, you guys will read some and hear some uh, different uh, perspectives on oil spills, but I wanted to make sure we started off from um, what I would consider the proper grounding to think about um, this important event. And just like we learned from the start of the semester, there are a couple themes that we'll see repeated over and over again. One of those themes is this notion, uh, or one of the challenges, I should say, to our effective management or, th or the well-functioning uh, dynamics of a healthy coastal or marine ecosystem is pollution. And I think one of the types of pollution that people most, I think there's two, well, let me ask you guys. So when I say pollution, what do you guys think of? Water pollution, but what, 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 what's the pollu Let me ask this. Uh, when you think of pollution, what's the pollutant you think of? Trash. Trash. Okay. What else? What's that? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Okay. CO2. Nitrates. Nitrates. You guys are so uh, sciencey. I like that. Okay. So nutrients. Good. Anything else? Sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide. Public bathrooms. Man, that's great. I thought you guys would say plastic and oil, and then I was going to say, yes, that's right. But, um, but right, of course, yes, good, no, that's good. Yeah, so, so interesting that you guys think about CO2, uh, general trash, that kind of stuff, that, that's, uh, that's cool. Okay, well, in any event, let's talk about, uh, I think in, in the public's mind, one of the biggest um, things that they think of, which is pollution and pollution from oil. So obviously the biggest spill we've had in recent years uh, is attributable to the, the failures in the Gulf five years ago, Gulf of Mexico, and the insane thing that was the Deepwater Horizon blowout. Let me just clarify a couple things. I will say in this class and other places, uh, maybe deep, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill or the the BP oil spill or the Gulf of Mexico oil spill, technically what that was, was not an oil spill. That was technically an oil blowout. A spill is when we have a contained volume of oil in, in a container and that container breaks open somehow. It could be a ship, it could be a tanker, it could for that matter even be a, a, a volume of, of oil in a pipeline, as with the refugio spill. Um, but but, but it, is a, it is a contain, it's the stuff in the eggshell, and we cracked the eggshell and it came out. A blowout is different, fundamentally, and this particularly from a management context, blowout is different. A blowout is a uh, sticking a straw in a giant reservoir, okay? So a blowout could go on for, you know, n of course, nothing go on forever, but it could go on for weeks, months, years, right? And every day that that liquid is not contained, the spill grows greater and greater, whereas a spill is a, is a, a existing volume is released and either instantly or over the course of a few hours or so, and then we're dealing with that with that uh, source. A blowout, the problem is getting worse and worse by the minute, worse and worse uh, every day until the uh, rupture is sealed. So it's correctly referred to as a deep, as an, as the Deepwater Horizon blowout, but by convention, no one calls it a blowout except for me and a few other nerdy people like me. So we use the word oil spill because that's what the conventional language is. But just make sure you guys understand the difference. Okay, so let's talk about uh, this largest marine oil 
oil spill in U.S. history. Spilled uh, four point. Oh, let me also let me direct your attention to the bottom of the slide here for some translations. In general, when we talk about these types of issues, pollution, let's say, you should pay attention to the units that are discussed. The units will typically be chosen by folks that want to make a particular point, that are advocating for a particular view. So if someone can use a larger number, they would uh, tend to want to, to give it to you, for example, in the case of this bill, in gallons. Because then you can say, you know, almost 209 million gallons. If someone is trying to minimize the spill and make you think it's not as bad as it otherwise is, they might use barrels, which is one of the conventional uh, uh, ways of measuring volumes of oil, right? Because then it's only 4.9 million. And 4.9 million to the general public sounds way less than 209 million, right? So you should always be skeptical when folks are talking, particularly when they use different units that you're not super familiar with. I have the conversion of, of how you, you uh, uh, can translate these things from U.S. gallons to uh, uh, barrels to et cetera on the bottom. Okay. The best estimate of how much oil was released from the Deepwater Horizon, which you, you recall went for about three months, comes from what's known as the Flow Rate Technical Group. This is a bunch of technical experts, mostly university professors, a lot of engineers, that estimated the amount of oil coming out of the bottom of the ocean, in this case, primarily from video feeds, from high resolution video feeds, because we didn't have a good instrumentation. We didn't have a propeller in the middle of this thing calculating the volumes and stuff. The lawyers will tell you not that much oil came out because in a recent courtroom decision, the judge declared that number was a little bit too high. In my opinion, that's ridiculous. Uh, this was argued by the so-called responsible party, BP, they argued that it should be less, primarily because they paid fees based on how much oil was leaked. So even a small decrease in the estimate of oil that was released um, uh, translates into uh, a lower payment. Now, I'm not trying to say the oil companies are nefarious or anything like that. It's clearly in their self-interest to get the estimate reduced. But in our opinion, and for this class, we use science. And the science says it was um, a bit shy of 209 million gallons. And so that's the data that we will use. And that's the data that all adults will be using in the future, I, am, I would suggest to you. Uh, I don't consider lawyers adults. No, just kidding. OK, <laughs> so uh, just kidding. So, so um, what I've done here is I've, I've given you a sense of scale. Um, these are all important oil spills in the context of coastal and marine management. And then one, the Lakeview Gusher, just because we need to talk about it. So you hear in these coastal marine management issues oftentimes incorrect statistics that are released. Not necessarily nefarious, not necessarily people trying to intentionally mislead you, but rather it's an unfamiliar environment. And so as a consequence, um, for example, the, the largest spill that we know of was the end of the very first Gulf War. Saddam Hussein, evil bastard, when they were, they had invaded the country of Kuwait um, for a whole variety of reasons we won't go into in this, in this class. Um, and as they were leaving, as part of a literally scorched earth policy, they opened as many valves to as many oil wells as could be found. 
and set as much of that oil on fire as possible. That was for two reasons. One was because that oil then burned and created all this black soot and this horrible thick cloud of stuff and created a physical uh, obscurance uh, for you know American spy satellites and reconnaissance airplanes. So there was a tactical choice, but, but it was also pr pretty much a middle finger to the, Ku the Kuwaitis, right? They were trying to destroy their country as best they could and screw them over as best they could. Because this happened in the context of a war zone, because this happened um, in, you know, I mean, it was, it was insane. It was like end of the world, pools of flame. And to be clear, they didn't just set the oil that was on the surface, let's say, on fire. They also exploded wells, which will ignite a fire inside, down inside the earth, right? So um, those are very difficult to put out, and it took it, some of them took months to put out these fire these these uh, uh, flames inside subterranean structures. It took forever to put some of these out, and so um, and there weren't a lot of coastal marine scientists or oil scientists running around, right? They were mostly um, wildcatters. They're mostly guys from Texas that chew a lot and spit a lot and were blowing stuff up to try to put these fires out. And, and, and so, so as a consequence, it, we don't have any good estimates. The best estimate of the Kuwaiti oil field releases come from a United Nations uh, conference that happened a few years afterwards. <clears throat> so it's somewhere between uh, six and eight million barrels with, um, uh, and, th and this is just what I'm talking about in terms of the marine area. So there's an another about 1.6 million barrels um, on the, in, in uh, temporary lakes that were created on the, um, on the land. So the Kuwait, so using the Deepwater Horizon as our rubric here, the Kuwaiti releases, the 1991 release, was something like 120 to 165 percent of the Deepwater Horizon. So close, same order of magnitude, but it was still more by all our best estimates. The Exxon Valdez spill. Uh, was a fraction of the Deepwater Horizon. And, it, and, and again, the Kuwaiti, the Deepwater Horizon, those were blowouts. The Exxon was our first true oil spill on this list that we're seeing. That released about three quarters of a million barrels from a giant tanker. The tanker was taking crude oil from the northern slope of Alaska that had been shunted down through a pipeline to southern Alaska where it was put onto uh, tankers and those tankers would then go down to ports in the lower 48 to refineries etc and in this case uh, the captain hazelwood was um, had uh, some dependency problems and was an alcoholic and started drinking early the ship left port, was heading out, was heading out to sea, but was not yet out to sea, was still within the, the, the coastal zone. And he went down uh, to basically drink more and pass out. And he left uh, one of his lieutenants in command who was not, uh, not as, as able and essentially ran the ship aground. It, the, the contact with the land, or the reef I should say, tore open the, the steel container of the ship, and that released a bunch of oil into um, Prince William Sound. Um, huge deal. This is when I was in an undergraduate. This was when I was uh, like, like where you guys were, a freshman, and, uh, and this was massive. This, this had huge impacts. The Exxon spill changed policy in the United States towards oil production and particularly oil movement. An entire new approach to dealing with oil spills came out of the Exxon spill. Talk about that in a little bit. Um, radical overhaul, 
That's what one would expect from a massive natural disaster, or not, I shouldn't say a natural disaster, excuse me, that was wrong. That's what we'd expect from a human caused disaster in the natural world that had huge negative impacts. To this day, we don't have a significant herring population in this part of Alaska directly, unequivocally, absolutely caused by this single oil spill. You know, uh, 25, 26 odd years later. That's crazy. Um, okay, more about that later. Okay, the next one we'll talk about, 1979, Ixtoc 1. This occurred in the Gulf of Mexico in Mexican territorial waters. This was close to the deep water horizon. This is about 70% of the volume of oil released as was released from the deep water horizon. This was Pemex, which is the state oil company of Mexico, was drilling in an offshore uh, waters, thankfully shallow, only 50 meters. So what we would consider not very deep at all, especially by today's standards, but even by standards of the day. They had a platform, it screwed up, it went crazy, and they super, super lucked out. They lucked out in that the um, winds and currents blew the oil straight north into the Gulf of Mexico. And it made the impact look much lower than it was. It didn't really come ashore. It didn't really destroy fishing villages as was initially feared. Um, etc. If you want to see a prequel to what happened with the Deepwater Horizon, go read about the Ixtoc 1 spill. Top Hat, all these types of approaches that was, were exactly what they tried. Almost, almost page for page. The oil primarily went north into the um, Caribbean into the Gulf of Mexico. Didn't really make landfall in a significant way until it got to, it went basically straight across the, the Gulf of Mexico until it got to the southern coast of the United States. Primarily landed in Texas. You're welcome. It had been very weathered. We'll talk about weathering in a second. But weathering is essentially the, um, the aging of oil, where a lot of the most toxic, volatile components leave, and you're left with the more stable, goopy fraction of the oil. That was very weathered. It was also attacked heavily from the air with dispersants. So the stuff that got to Texas was significant, but it was, it was nothing like what actually came out of the bottom of the ocean. And it was quite old. So we learned a lot from the Ixtoc 1 arrivals, but um, uh, not as much as you might otherwise think for that volume of oil being released. So that was a, we lucked out in a big bad way in many respects. Um, but also, it was 1979, our sentinel monitoring networks, our approaches to looking for impacts were very limited. So we didn't have a bunch of the tools that we have now to quantify what impacts were going to happen or, 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 or that, that would ensue from being oiled. Of course, the most famous oil spill in our part of the world is the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. Again, more about this in a second. Um, amongst other things, this gives rise to our modern or, or helps foster in our modern array of environmental laws that are, by many respects, the envy of, of folks around the world and inspired um, replication across the world and really helped uh, crystallize the, the nascent environmental movement that was starting across the United States. But this was a tiny bill in, in relative to the deep water horizon. This was only a few hundred thousand barrels. 
uh, 2% of the deep water horizon, occurring at about the same depth as the Ixtoc one would, would happen, uh, would occur in a, a decade later. Perhaps the, the, the most important um, first, maybe we call it the first modern oil spill, would be the Torrey Canyon. The Torrey Canyon, this is in um, the UK. This is in, uh, let's see, southwestern UK. This was a tanker. The Torrey Canyon was the, was the name of the tanker, oil tanker. It was coming from the south, going north. And it was one of our, was one of our very first so-called super tankers that could take large volumes of oil and you know this thing was was massive especially by standards of the late 60s we have we have bigger ships now but it was incredible um, and basically again it was a navigational error the captain decided he wanted to shave off some time and and uh, cut too close to an offshore reef this offshore reef uh, uh, snags the bottom of the, uh, basically they run aground and they tear open the side and they release a bunch of oil uh, along the British coast. And eventually it, it goes in the channel and it eventually hits the French coast as well. So uh, again, we did not have our sentinel monitoring uh, tools in place at the time. But this really spurred a lot of folks to start to think about we need to have monitoring programs in place so that when a spill happens, we can actually objectively quantify the impact of that spill. Also, the Torrey Canyon gave rise to a new generation of oil tankers that were more protective, as did the Exxon. The Exxon gave us double-hulled, uh, at least in U.S. waters, a requirement for double-hulled tankers. Um, but the, the, the spill I want to end with is by way of introduction, the bottom here is the Lakeview Gusher. That happened almost 100 years to the day that the Deepwater Horizon happened, and nobody knows about this spill. The Lakeview Gusher is the largest oil spill in U.S. history. What a great quiz question. What was the largest marine oil spill in U.S. history? And what is the largest oil spill in U.S. history? Right, they're not the same. So the Lakeview Gusher released almost 200% of the oil that was released in the Deepwater Horizon, but this was a 100% terrestrial phenomenon. This was not a coastal or marine phenomenon. This is what that looked like. This is, the Lake View, this is the Lake View Gusher as it had been gushing. We are in southwestern Kern County. We are about an hour, hour and a half, well, maybe more like an hour and a half drive from campus here. Essentially very close to the bottom of the grapevine, if you're driving on the five towards Northern California. And, uh, and this, is, this is a black and white photo, but what you're seeing is not water. That liquid is all oil. Back in the day, uh, so, so California, here's another great quiz question. Um, California is number four in terms of oil producing states in the United States. We always think about Alaska. We always think about um, Louisiana. Maybe we think about Texas, but California is fourth. with all of our environmental protections and all of our limits on fracking and all this and that, we still produce a huge amount of oil relative to the rest of the United States. And at the time that this happened, the Lakeview Gusher happened, we were, and were for a long time, up until World War II, we were the number one oil producing uh, state. So There Will Be Blood, that movie, was essentially um, it was a fictionalized account, but it was, was based on what was going on in Kern County and Ventura County and places like that in the early, uh, very early years of the 1900s. 
back in the day, and there's a great exhibit on this. If you guys have, you know, you, I know you guys have so much time on your free time right now. So if you're looking for a place to go do some of your opinion poll surveys, why not go to Santa Paula, the great town of Santa Paula, go to the Santa Paula Oil Museum. They have some really cool exhibits on, on what it was like to drill for oil back in the day. It was by hand. And so when this happened in 1910, uh, essentially how, what people would do is they'd walk around, they'd look for areas where the plants were dead, or the plants looked reddish, or the, the vegetation looked as if it was stressed in some way. And they would say in places like Kern County, which were, were, had a lot of oil deposits very close to the surface, they said, um, well, here's an area, let's start digging. So they literally just start, took out um, you know, pickaxes and started digging, 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 digging. In the case of Lakeview Gusher, they'd gone in and they were using what was essentially uh, on a tripod, a big giant metal wedge. And they would pull that wedge up and then let it go. And the weight of it would crash down on the rock and it would crack a little bit of the rocks. And they'd go down, they'd dig out some of the rocks. So it was very old school mining technology, right? They were going down, going down, going down, and all of a sudden, crack, they struck oil, and it started flowing, and it didn't stop. You saw with the Deepwater Horizon, how do we stop this? This is, a, this is a challenging thing by today's standards. Back in the day, without robots, without uh, you know, modern hydraulics and things like that, it was, it, they just let it go. So, and nobody knew what was going to happen. So it went on for a day, and then it went on for longer, and then it for weeks, and then for months, and ultimately about a year of continuous flow. It created a series of three large lakes of pure oil. What you're looking at, and so this top picture right here, you see some guys on a barge. That's a lake of oil there going across and and the deepest part of some of these lakes was 30 meters I mean, this is an insane volume of oil so what we're looking at here is and it, it, it started happening and it was blowing out and it was blowing out and it was blowing out and it just grew right and essentially caved in the earth around it and just kept going and so they tried all kinds of stuff so here you can see these guys these guys are uh, have sandbagged it and it, they're, they're trying all these things, and it just kept blowing out. They tried throwing rail cars into it. They tried throwing sandbags into it. And it just it was this constant pressure blowing out of oil. Um, train tracks were laid from Los Angeles. Tourist trains would come up for the day to take pictures of the oil fountain. On days when the wind was blowing towards the train, you had to keep the windows up because the train would be covered in oil. On days when the wind was blowing away from the tracks, you could drop those windows down and take pictures of this crazy thing. So this was insane. This was totally insane. And then one day, basically, the pressure, we, we, we released enough pressure so that there was some kind of equilibration between the surface pressure and the subsurface pressure. And it just kind of flop, 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 flop. Then over the course of a, a day or two, it, it stopped flowing. And that was it. What was the ecological impact of the Lakeview Gusher? Who knows? There was no CSUCI. No UC Merced. No, no whatever. No, no Bakers, CSU Bakersfield. There's nothing. People didn't study it. A super cool, uh, totally awesome, nerdy ESRM field trip would be to jump in your guy's car, drive up to the five, drive down to the end, get off by Button Willow, and go to the Kern County Oil Museum. Super cool oil museum. Free. All these very sweet, very old ladies with blue hair that have nothing to do are sitting there. They're wonderful folks. 
and they will tell you everything you want to know about oil exploration in Kern County. And there are some really awesome exhibits from like 1984 kind of deal. That's awesome museum. And in there, so all my photos from the from from Lakeview Gusher come from the Kern County Oil Museum. Uh, and it's just very interesting. It's really cool. You can finish with that tour, go outside, drive about, I forget, five or ten minutes, and you can visit the site of the Lakeview Gusher, which is crazy. It's just, there's a historical monument, a plaque there, and that's about it. it. It's just some little hole in the ground, and kids are mountain biking, and there's broken beer bottles around, and it's, it, there's nothing to mark the fact that this was, or with exception of the plaque, there's nothing to mark that this was the largest oil spill in U.S. history. We do not know what the ecotoxicology this was. We did, don't know how it affected plants and animals. It must have had a massive effect. But no one was studying it, and the whole area was, a and still is, a massive oil and gas production area. So to try to look at what the effect of the deep water, of the uh, deep water ride, so, sorry. Sorry, faux pas. To look at what the effect of the Lakeview Gusher was um, is, is, is essentially impossible at this point. All right, let's move on to our iconic, most important marine oil spill to date, I would argue, even more important than the Deepwater Horizon. The 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. There's a couple themes that emerged from this spill, and I want to talk about those themes first. The first one is that an oil spill, in this case, this is a blowout. A spill in the ocean environment is uncontrollable, and it's of an immense scale, too much for us to get our arms wrapped around. What we're looking at here is platform A, we're looking straight down on it. And it looks as if there's, uh, I don't know, somebody cracked, somebody shook up a Coke bottle and cracked it open, and it's all this bubbling, and that's actually the oil, oil and gas methane coming up, and the the sheen that you're seeing on the surface is all oil. The region that was affected ranged from Ventura to Pismo Beach, although the the most heavily impacted area was right there in uh, sort of. UCSB area to Summerland area uh, of Santa Barbara County. The next theme that emerges from the 1969 oil spill is this theme of we humans being technologically impotent, that we're unable to use sophisticated technology to stop an oil spill. The picture in the upper left quadrant here is an image uh, many days after the a week or so after the oil spill started. This is the, at the time, secret, uh, oh, I'm not, not as secret because it, the, the, it was out, but this is a U-2 spy plane image. We didn't have the kind of resources we have now. So when people were just even trying to figure out how much oil is spilt, we had to task military resources to fly over the spill. So President Nixon had to sign a special waiver that allowed the U-2 spy plane to collect images in US uh, territory, as opposed to flying over Russia, who cares, right? We can take pictures of, of Russia all we want, but, but this was a special um, image. Oil started washing up on shore. Oil started washing up on shore where the nice people are, where the wealthy people are, where the powerful people are, and they didn't like it. They didn't like it. And so when this oil washed up on shore, what did we do? We took some straw bales, spread straw out over the beach, let that straw alone for a few minutes, let that straw absorb the oil, and then go around and pick up that oil, scrape up that straw. Now you have oily straw, and you throw that oily straw in a dump truck and take it to a, um, a, a, a yeah, landfill. 
Really? That that's that's our sophisticated. We're, we just got to the moon technology. Is throw some straw on the beach. Well, that's interesting. So they did that. And and related to this immense and uncontrollable, we would do that, and then the next day more oil would wash ashore, and these guys here would have to go back to the beach, and scrape it up with with nets and scrape it up with with uh, ladles and scrape it up with straw. The third theme that emerged that we still live with from the 1969 oil spill is this notion of significant ecological impact of an oiling event. So I, w I did my undergraduate degree at, at UCSB in Santa Barbara. And so uh, this picture on the left, upper left, it was a nightmare. So what are we seeing there? This is all the things that are messed up. So you see wildlife, in this case a cormorant that's oiled, so that's messed up. Two, you see this kelp frond totally covered in oil, so the landscape, the natural communities are totally impacted. And then that's on a surfboard, and so then you couldn't surf. What? Worst thing ever, right? So this oil spill was really affecting all aspects of the local environment. Amongst other things, it induced the gentleman on the right there, this veterinarian, to do the first ever attempt to de-oil birds with detergent. So in this case, they're using basically dishwashing soap. To, they've recovered this oiled and ailing bird, and they are rubbing, with their fingertips, rubbing detergent through the feathers of the bird, and then, and then washing, and then you know, rinsing it off to get the oil out of its feathers. Um, we know now that, especially in the early days, this really was uh, most, most of the time when we capture animals at this point, they're already dead. Because be they a, a um, um, otter, a sea otter, be they a bird, most of these ocean-dwelling critters, their, their, their covering, their fur and feathers, are a key part of the way they stay warm and, and stay insulated. And so the reason you always see these birds preening and, and, and that kind of stuff, just like you'll see a rabbit always cleaning itself, um, is they're trying to keep their fur clean so their fur acts as an insulating barrier. So as soon as they get oil on it, they're used to getting snot on it. They're used to getting eggshells on it. They're used to getting kelp mucilage on their feathers. So what do they do? They go and they preen. They, they use their mouth to get that oil off. And they therefore ingest that material. And if it's, if it's kelp mucilage or if it's egg whatever, that's fine. But when it's oil, they've actually ingested the oil. And so um, oftentimes by the time we get these critters, they're already, they've already ingested a toxic amount of this material. But nevertheless, this, the 69 oil spill was the spur to try to invent technologies to help rehabilitate wildlife impacted by oil spills. And we have the very unfortunate quote from, so Union Oil was the, was the then oil company that controlled the platform that, that blew, had the blowout. Um, and this was said by the president of the oil company down in, in Santa Barbara Harbor as the oil spill was still unfolding. And uh, Mr. Hartley had the unfortunate uh, uh, sense to say what was, what was happening at the moment and everybody was referring to it as a disaster. I don't like to call it a disaster because there's been no loss of human life. I'm amazed at the publicity for the loss of a few birds. So this notion of a tone-deaf polluter to the potential ecological impact um, was huge. And, and you might have seen the same exact thing with uh, a British executive during the Deepwater Horizon. All these three trends come together and produce this tremendous, um, this is before social media, um, this tremendous, we, we would now call trending uh, event. A media and a public absolute firestorm. There's no other word for it. Absolute crazy um, media, just insane. So, uh,
not a lot of press initially. And uh, then it starts to build as people realize what's going on. We have people protesting uh, entities. We have the birth of Goo, which is this uh, environmental group called Get Oil Out. Also helped birth the Environmental Defense Center in Santa Barbara, which just the other day uh, won a, a major lawsuit against the Environmental Protection Agency in, in Stormwater, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, uh, Got to do something. Got to do something. So eventually the president, in this case President Nixon, this is President Nixon at the beach, after, you know, after a few weeks, he apparently has to go and make a visit to the beach and walk around and kick the sand and act like he cares and act like he's doing something, right? This, these are a bunch of uh, ladies who are doing another protest. They're about to get naked. So they get naked to protest stuff. So there's this, everything people are doing is to keep this, this story in the press and, and all this and that. Um, it induces the president to uh, consider a ban on, on offshore drilling, and it leads to, um, essentially, uh, directly leads to the state that we have right now in terms of our offshore oil drilling, which we'll talk about later. It causes, for example, San Marcos High, the local high school, to throw out their existing play that they were planning on uh, uh, presenting and doing a melodrama where, and here you can see the, the, the poor uh, defenseless little lady who's Barbara is being attacked by the evil oil baron and he's coming to coat her in oil, right? So from every level of our culture, this became a thing. This became a thing at the national level. This became a thing at the local level. And it really took on a life of its own and it created narratives that we unfortunately are burdened with to this day whenever we have an oil spill. Okay, so this is what happens specifically. Uh, do you guys need a break? You guys want to keep going? No? This, we're so interactive. Today. Okay, so okay, so let's talk about what happened with, this, with the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. Again, you know it's a blowout. And this is, again, for scale, this is roughly 2% of the deep water horizon spill. Uh, the primary flow, okay, before, before that, the only reason we know there was an oil, the only the first tip off that there was an oil spill was someone called the Santa Barbara News Press, the local newspaper in Santa Barbara, at night, and essentially left a message that said, uh, you should know what's happening off of Summerlin. There's an oil spill going on right now. And, and you know, the reporter was like, who is this? I'm not going to say. This person hung up. So there was a whistleblower that was presumably a rig worker. And, and that's, that's how the public first learned that there was an oil spill happening, right? So the company didn't call everyone and say, oh my gosh, there's an oil spill. They were trying to keep it on the lowdown. They were trying to solve the problem without anybody knowing, et cetera. So this happened uh, in the early part of 1969. This happened in January. That's important um, because it was a stormy time of the year. The primary flow lasted for 11 days. Uh, a lower flow rate, a more diffuse flow rate, happened for at least a year. Uh, the exact data, you'd think that someone would have this down. It wasn't, it, it, we don't know. But the major goop, 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 goop bubbling out from around the, the uh, you know, up to the surface water lasts for about 11 days. So this is a blowout, meaning the structure that contains the well um, has a catastrophic failure. Uh, essentially, we, when we drill an oil well, we dig a hole down to the ground through whatever the geology that's there is. Through sand, through bedrock, through whatever. To make sure that 
we don't that, that we get all the oil and doesn't escape somewhere we usually put a, stru a structure down into that excavation we've made so you can think of it as a metal straw we put a pipe straight down into the ground that way if the ground cracks if the rock fractures the oil is still contained within our metal straw At the time, we didn't have our existing regulatory structure. So at the time, uh, the USGS was essentially providing some technological expertise on this. And the company said, in effect, uh, how much should we make this a paper straw and how much should we make it a metal straw, a, an encased, a reinforced strong straw? And the, uh, the government engineers said, oh, you know, just the top little bit is cool. And the company said, OK, fine. We're not going to bear the expense of putting a metal straw through the entire kilometer length of this hole through, this, through the undersea rock. And so what essentially happened was the ground around that well bore cracked and then oil and gas was escaping. When they tried to plug it up, they essentially threw stuff down that straw and that didn't work. It just led to cracks around, right? It just, it just, it just led to less oil come out of that tube and just cracked the, the surface of the ocean more and the oil bubbled up around um, through, a, a, who knows, hundreds of probably little micro fissures across the seafloor. As I said before, this induces massive media circus, primarily because this is where the media vacation. A huge proportion of the entertainment industry from Los Angeles would go to Santa Barbara for the weekend or for the summer or for whatever. And so when this started happening, this wasn't out in the middle of podunk, somewhere this was in these people's places so they took this personally so the people that produced the news were offended themselves and worried themselves this really helped crystallize the modern environmental movement and helped lead to directly um, support for passage of a whole series of laws like the clean water act like the endangered species act like the like nepa um, all those and others that you've been learning about in your other classes um, were really – so two things happened in 69. One was big major media stories. One was this. Does anybody know the other one that happened? This is what we always think about because we're Californians. It involved water. It involved flames. Yes. Do you remember what it's called? Cuyahoga River, the Cuyahoga River. So this, is, this was Midwest, Ohio. And uh, basically the river caught on fire for the fifth time. And so people were looking at that going, you know what? You know, r rivers are not supposed to be easily, you know, caught, caught on fire. And so people started saying, you know, there's something amiss here if our rivers are on fire. And if oil is just washing up in our, in our beaches, maybe we're not doing things in the most responsible manner as we could be. Uh, next, this really sets up this unfortunate narrative, which is the oil companies are greedy and evil, always. And, it's, and, and the story that, that's painted, the conceptualization that's painted is always greedy oil bastards versus the poor widow birdies or the poor widow sea otter or the poor widow marine mammal right or it's the greedy evil oil executives versus the not in my backyard enviros so for example the story that's painted uh, the news articles will read something like evil evil oil executive 
says, why, well, I don't call it a disaster. Why would I call it a disaster, right? That guy's clearly an idiot. And stories are run about the Get Oil Out, the new, the new environmental group that's formed to say, we need to get oil out of the channel. And they talk about the fact that these guys drive their giant Osmobiles to the protest with one person in the car. So let me get this straight. You want, you want to drive your car to the place where you want people to not get oil? So you only want oil from the Niger Delta. You only want oil from Louisiana Gulf. Right? So, so it sets up these unfortunate narratives and these stories that we keep getting stuck with. And because we're stuck with these very ingrained narratives, it's hard to move forward as adults and create more effective policy, more effective management. OK. Um, toxicity. Clearly, this oil, <laughs> I know this goes, that I shouldn't have to say this, but I'll just say it anyway. It was bad for birds and marine mammals and invertebrates. Um, yeah, right. Surprise, surprise. When you're covered with oil, that might not be healthy for you. So we saw a high impact of this oil spill on marine birds, on seabirds and shorebirds, on marine mammals. Both those guys are interacting with the surface of the ocean as that oil accumulates on the surface of the ocean. So they're getting stuck in oil slicks, basically. The third major group that's impacted by uh, oil toxicity are the critters that live in the intertidal. Because this wave upon, or, you know, this, this surge upon surge of uh, oil keeps coming in and, and landing on them and, and, and fouling up the barnacles shells with oil and they can't get their heads out to get food and everything else. Um, so that's that. Everybody said at the time, oh my God, this is going to destroy the Santa Barbara fishing industry, the fisheries there, the working harbors. It's going to destroy the kelp. It's going to destroy this and that. It did not massively, from what we can tell, it did not massively harm the fisheries. It did not massively harm the, the kelp beds long term. And uh, people were st started wondering, why? Why is that? And people weren't sure. And so that led to um, people in America, for the first time in a real robust way, starting to look at the toxicology of oil and oil spills. So there's some money goes to USC. At the time, USC had a really robust uh, marine ecology, marine, marine science program. They basically destroyed the whole program for the most part um, because they think that uh, genetics is the only interesting biology. And they realize you can't make money in marine science. And so they only really like to do stuff they can make money in. Um, so they unfortunately, by the 1980s, they dismantled their entire marine biology program, which was one of the best in the country. Um, but at the time, they you know, had some great scientists there, so they, they, gave, they gave this some money. And these, guys, and these guys had money to do a study. And, this, and the question was, why wasn't the Santa Barbara oil spill um, even worse than it was? You know, how come it wasn't the end of the world, like people said? And how come people are able to fish now and, and all this and that? What the authors of that multi-volume study basically said was, we don't know what happened during the 69 oil spill because we primarily didn't have a baseline of the way things were beforehand. So for example, so, so the oil spill happened off of Summerland, right? A few miles south of downtown Santa Barbara. So it took a little bit for the oil to get to other places. So for example, uh, some professors at UCSB ran right out to Goleta, ran right out to the shores of the ocean next to UCSB and started count threw down some quadrats and started counting how many barnacles there were right, right then. And then you know, the next day or two as the oil washed on and the, the critters died and they went and checked again and sure enough there was an impact, right? That was one of the few places where we actually had before data. 
to be able to compare the, objectively. Yes, there was, I don't know, the, you know, there, there, there were 100 barnacles in per square meter beforehand, and now there's none. There really wasn't that information out there. So by and large, what the folks said from USC is that we need to start doing this. We need to, we need to create some baseline monitoring programs and fund them so that we can honestly say what the impact is or isn't. And we can say that with statistical rigor. We can test hypotheses robustly. Then they essentially go on and say, well, we don't, we don't have any that data, so we'll just do our best, best interpretation of what we think we saw. All of their conclusions were predicated on the fact that we don't, we di you know, don't have a kick-butt monitoring program. We weren't looking at the conditions before the spill happened. Nevertheless, they produced what I would argue are three main uh, conclusions, three main takeaways from what happened with the Santa Barbara spill in terms of ecological impact. And we've essentially, just like we've been stuck with the narratives and the impressions in the wider public from the 69 oil spill to date, I would argue scientifically and from a management standpoint, we've, been, we've inherited these three themes from this USC study. The first one is just what uh, Aspen was asking about um, a little bit ago which was, hey, you know, uh, what's the difference between an oil, s and, and, there, and of course, the Santa Barbara Channel full of oil seeps, full of oil slicks, has had oil slicks going back forever, right? For, for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. The Chumash Tomos, their, their canoes, their, their, their famous plank canoes were only seaworthy because we had tar everywhere and they could they could slap this tar in between the, the cracks of the planks of their vessels and make them seaworthy. So oil on our beaches is not new. Oil on our beaches is not the result of oil companies drilling for oil. Oil companies are drilling for oil here because there was oil washing up on our beaches in the first place. So it was an obvious sign that there was subsurface petroleum reserves. And so what people said was, well, that clearly that, that's what's going on here. So the, the eukaryotic organisms, the bacteria, those guys have lived here for millions of years with oil seeps. So they've evolved a tolerance to this oil. So that, therefore, if you spill oil here, don't worry about it. It's not going to hurt the microbes. They're used to it, in a sense. And indeed, these microbes love to eat oil. So it's all good. They'll just eat the oil. That's the first theme you hear. And so that's why it must not have been a big impact, because it all got gobbled up by the little, little bacterial critters. The second big explanation was that, as I mentioned before, this happened in winter. And so why didn't we see more destruction and in, in absolute uh, end of the world stuff happen with our, with our 69 oil spill? Well, because storms came in. We had a, a, a couple storms blast through and the storms chopped up the water. The storms mixed up the oil. The storms um, made the oil sink. Period. New paragraph. Start of the chapter. As if the only possible ecotoxicological eco impact would be at the surface of the ocean. So don't worry about the midwater critters. Don't worry about the things that live on the bottom of the ocean. Storms will take care of that, right? They'll remove that oil from where you and I can easily inspect that oil. So a total disregard for the rest of the water column. And then, um, right, and I'll just say that. So the general thought was that critters that could move, say your whales, they swam out of the way of the oil. C 
critters that couldn't easily move, like the microbial guys, they've evolved with this, so it's okay. And so it was, it was sort of the, in essence, the freaks or the unlucky ones, the birds, the marine mammals, the, the, the smaller marine mammals, and intertidal critters, and, and by extension, seagrass beds, those are the things that took the, the brunt of the impact. Now, if you go read about the Exxon spill, if you go read about uh, the, the Costco Busan if you, in San Francisco a few years ago, if you go read about the Deepwater Horizon, you'll see these same things coming up again and again. How do we deal with it? Get the microbes to eat it all. Isn't that going to mess with the microbial community? No, they're cool. Right? How do we deal with the oil? We spray dispersants on the surface of the oil. Uh, excuse me, the surface of the ocean. Why? Because that'll tend to make the oil uh, not be on the surface of the, of the ocean as much. And it'll make them more easily digestible by, by, by microbes. These, these statements aren't necessarily wrong, but they in and of themselves paint an overly simplistic picture of the fate and transport of oil in the coastal or marine environment. And you know you hear time and time again, oh, you don't need to worry about this because there's lots of oil seeps in the area. So it's just part of the deal. So that is our inheritance from the Santa Barbara uh, oil spill. Not just policy approaches and not just things such as uh, one of the most important things that comes out of this is the county of Santa Barbara creates its own division within their planning division, their own division to deal with oil and gas drilling and operation. And that entity is probably one of the strongest uh, most rigorous enforce, uh, uh, creators of, of rules and regulations and enforcers of rules and regulations in the country. So we have policy things that come out of this. We have national, local policy, national level policy. We have this conceptualization. There can never be an oil spill after 69 without you seeing a picture of an oiled seabird. Whether it's our little small refugio spill here whether it's the big giant deep water horizon, what's the image? The image is the oiled bird, not the destroyed jellyfish, not the oiled deep sea coral, but an oiled pelican or an oiled cormorant, something like that. Um, and so, so this, this 69 oil spill has had dramatic effects on our general public conceptualization of what an oil spill is and our, our government's conceptualization of what an oil spill is and our scientific community's conceptualization of what an oil spill is. Okay? So with that, I think, uh, I think that's a good breaking point to stop. And we'll pick this up next time talking about oil spills. Questions? Do you guys have any questions about that so far? Make sense? Yeah, Aspen. Excellent question. So how do we tell the difference between a, um, let's say we're walking on the beach and we see some oil on the beach. How do we tell if that came from an oil uh, rig or let's say maybe someone's boat sprung a leak or from just a crack on the bottom of the ocean? And the answer is you can't with your eyeballs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With your eyeballs, you can't. So the, the, the actual answer is we fingerprint it. So we take the oil, we put it, into ma put it into a spectrometer, and we look for signatures. So we'll talk about this when we talk about the refugio spill, but that's actually a fundamental part of the story of the refugio oil spill. That's why I was waiting to talk about it then. But, but suffice it to say, um, uh, we couldn't easily tell. So in some of the beaches we were hitting, like classic one would be coal oil point. The, the uh, platform that was drilling into the oil formation that was sucking up oil that went into the pipeline that eventually leaked, that, that oil formation was only about a mile or so offshore from Coal Oil Point. 
So the same oil that's leaking out through, through seeps is the same oil that's being piped out of the ground. So chemically, that's identical. So it gets really hard. Um, once we put it in pipelines, sometimes we put some additional uh, uh, chemicals in there to make it flow more easily. You can look for those chemicals. But with the exception of that, you, you can't really tell. So in the case of the refugio spill, um, it was essentially, essentially impossible to tell if the stuff, because it was chemically identical, this is the stuff in that pipeline was basically chemically identical to the stuff that was coming out of the ground a few hundred meters offshore. If we talk about the stuff that was washing ashore in Los Angeles County, that is not the case. That's 100 kilometers away. And you can therefore see a signature of, of that. And so, so the short version is to answer your, your question, in a practical sense, it's really, um, it's really a best guess. So it's really uh, someone that walks the beach every day or goes down to the beach every week. And they have their expectation of the amount of oil that comes up from the seeps. So on a routine basis, maybe when I rock across the beach, I get two little dimes worth of oil on the bottom of my feet. Then one day you walk across the beach and your, your foot is covered with oil. Um, while it is possible because seep activity also waxes and wanes because of underground pressures and different things. Sometimes it'll, it'll, it'll be a bit more, and actually right now we're in a relatively heavy period of seepage um, in our region compared to quote unquote background levels. Um, so you would get um, maybe a lot of oil on my feet and I would say, hey, this is not normal. And then you come back a week or two later and it's more like the two or three dime-sized dollops on the bottom of your feet. That's a pretty strong indication that that, that that oil came from a discrete event. The seep things would be more like it comes up and it stays up for a while, right? And so, so the answer is there's, 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 oftentimes there isn't a good way to tell. Um, one way to tell, though, would be in an area that doesn't routinely get seeps. So, for example, let's say right around camp, uh, UCSB Campus Point, because of the way the currents flow, we, there's some beaches that capture a lot of oil, and then others, because they're in essentially the, the, the shadow of the current, the shadow of the oil moving down coast, you get very little. And so only when you have a heavy oiling event, say from an oil spill, um, would, you routinely get, would you consistently get a lot of oil accumulated in that back bay kind of area. Um, or you have an area that you don't routinely have any oil at all and then get some oil. Those would be indicators, but again, they're just, they're just indicators. There's, there's no 100% proof if you're in an area right adjacent to heavy seepage. Um, once we get in areas farther removed, you can, that's not exactly the case, but yeah, it's a tough one. It's, it's, a, it's a very challenging um, thing, and people will go both ways on that. People will argue a little bit of oil means it's super bad, and people will also argue a little bit of oil means it's not bad. And um, it's, it's a difficult call. It's a difficult call. And we'll, we'll talk about more about that when we talk about the refugio spill. Other questions? All right, cool. I'll see you guys uh, on Wednesday. <laughs>